43 years. Uh, I started coming here when I was a teenager, when I was 15. And when I first came here, I thought, wow, this place is amazing. So it's, um, I have not been disappointed in the 53 years that I've been coming here. So I moved in 43 years ago. I sort of thought about it for a long time. But uh, the, uh, in 1977, I made the leap and joined. And I'm, I have not regretted that for one second. So um, let's start out with a peace chant. Om Shano Mitra Shamvarunaha Shano Bhavatra Yama Shano Mitra Brihaspatihi Shano Vishnuru Kramaha Namo Brahmane Namaste Vayo Twamheva Pratyaksham Brahmasi Twamheva Pratyaksham Brahmavadishami Pratam Vadishami, Satyam Vadishami, Tanma Mavatu, Tad Vaktara Mavatu, Avatu Mam, Avatu Vaktaram. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Om. May the day be auspicious to us. May the night be auspicious to us. May the sun be auspicious to us and may the winds be auspicious to us. May strength be within us and may the Lord of all heavens, the upholder of truth and righteousness, be propitious to us. May Brahman protect us and may Brahman protect our teachers. Om peace, peace, peace be unto us all. So again today, I wanted to talk about fearlessness. You know, when I was 15, I started attending the Vedanta Temple here. And I remember that one Friday night, I, I was able to finagle my parents into coming up here with me because I was too young to drive. So I was always having to find someone to, to drive me up here. But those were the days when we were having Friday night classes here. So I finagled my parents to please, let's go to this, this class and Swami Vandananda, who later became the general secretary of the Ramakrishna order, was giving a, a class on the Bhagavad Gita. And he was a wonderful speaker. He was a wonderful human being and so warm and inviting and just fantastic human being. So really enjoyed his classes. So we, had, so we were attending Swami Vandanada's class on uh, the Bhagavad Gita. Now in these classes, at the end of the class, you could ask the Swami a question out loud, seated from the audience. Or you could, if you were um, a fraidy cat like me, then you would write a question and put it in. They had these little pieces of paper and you would write it out and the usher would hand it to the Swami. And at the end, the Swami would read out the question and he would give the answer. <clears throat> now, because I was young and oversensitive, I didn't want to embarrass myself by showing how, how stupid I was. And so I wrote out the question in the back of the temple, what is fear? And at the end of the, at the end of the Gita class, Swami Bandarananda wrote, read it, what is fear? Ha! Someone here doesn't know, someone here knows no fear. And everyone burst out laughing. And I was just mortified. And I thought, oh my God, now everyone knows who asked the stupid question. But it wasn't a stupid question to me. I was really serious about the question. And I really wanted to know something deeper about fear because I was aware of the fact that I often felt fearful. I think a lot of this had to do that I was young and female and small. And I already had stacked up some really unpleasant experiences due to the fact that I was young, female and small. And, um, but there were other fears too. Uh, it's like, what if I don't do well in my class? What if, I, what if I can't meet these academic expectations? What if I can't get a job? What, what if I gain 50 pounds? What, what, what if I never have any friends? What if no one ever likes me? Remember, I was 15, you know, 15, you, you, you worry about these things. 
When you get older, you don't care if people like you or not. But at 15, you really care whether people like you or not. So it's like, what am I got? And so there were these fears that were based in real fact, real experience. And then there was just these anxieties, these worries that I was aware that were kind of preying upon me. And I was also aware of the fact that I wanted to feel fearless. I didn't want to be hedged around with fear and anxiety and this trepidation, always kind of looking over your shoulder. I wanted to feel like strong, that I was fearless. So I wanted a solid answer. And later the Swami said something about ego identification, but whatever it was, it, at the time I wasn't, I really wanted a solid answer that would give me a way to manage fear, manage my, my trepidation and, and anxiety. Because all of us, to some extent or another, are hedged around by fear and anxiety. We, some to an, a debilitating extent, some to a mild or a moderate degree, and some just enough to keep them out of trouble, and some seem to invite trouble by kind of going out of their way to face fear by like swimming, they, they go surfing in 80 foot waves, or they go skiing down a mountaintop or run into traffic. But um, maybe that's their way of dealing with fear. Maybe that's the way of dealing with fear is just going head on. I don't know. To me, it's just stupid. But all of us feel fear at one time or another. All of us, uh, if we see a car headed our way careening towards us and they don't seem to see us, all of us kind of run the other direction. Instinctive reaction. All of us feel fear if we go to the doctor and he said, I'm sorry, you know, I've got some bad news for you. Uh, we all feel fear if that happens. We feel fear if a fire breaks out in our house. We feel fear if there's a mountain, the mountain above us has fire running down it. Believe me, you're going to feel fear. We feel fear from the path of a tornado or a hurricane. Or if you feel the, the earth beneath your feet starting to shake and then you hear that terrible tearing sound of the earth tearing when, you get in, when you're in the middle of an earthquake. And then you think, oh my God, I wish I was wearing better clothes for my demise. This is not, I don't want to be wearing a nightgown when they find me, but you know, you don't get a choice for that. So it seems like right now, a lot of people are living in fear. A lot of people are just dealing with the fact there's a lot of basic fear kind of clouding everybody's minds and judgments because there's fear of the unseen. We can't see COVID, but we can see that it takes a toll. But some of us have lost our friends. A lot of us know people who've been sick. If not, you know people who, who you read about in the newspaper or the see it on the news. You know it's taking a toll. So nobody wants to, no one wants to die a death like that. No one wants to die a death in the hospital. Nobody wants to be not with their loved ones when they die. Nobody wants to be the person where the doctor comes in in a space suit and looks at you with a, a mixture of, of pity and fear while you can't even be with the people that love you. Nobody wants to have their loved ones in that position. On the other hand, no one wants to get Alzheimer's. Nobody wants to get Parkinson's. Nobody wants to end up an, an invalid or as my guru used to say, an invalid, no one wants to end up that way. They don't want that either. So, and that's just the physical body. We also have other kinds of fears. We have economic fears. What if I run out of money before I die? What, and we have political fears. What if this person wins? What if that person loses? We have a huge amount of environmental fears, which are totally justified. I mean, if you're, if you're living in, in this planet, you've got some justifiable environmental fears right now. So what do we do with all of this? How do we deal with this fear that we can't process and we can't digest either? Well, there's a story from the Mahabharata that's really apt right now. In this story from the Mahabharata, Krishna and Balarama go into the forest. And they go deeper and deeper into the forest 
and then night falls. And this happens in India. It's like someone's turning off a switch, ding, all of a sudden it's dark. So they decide, okay, better we spend the night here in the forest. And so Krishna and Balaram decide, okay, we're gonna take turns. One of us will sleep and the other one will keep watch for danger and we'll just trade off doing this. So Krishna was sleeping and Balaram is keeping watch. And Krishna, while he's sleep, all of a sudden Balaram's keeping watch and all of a sudden this huge monster all of a sudden appears before Balaram and says, what are you doing? How dare you trespass in my forest? And this monster was huge and ugly and mean, terrifying. And Balaram shook in fear and then the monster just disappeared. And then after a while, the monster appeared again, even bigger and he like, how dare you trespass into my forest? And Balaram was shaking in fear. And the monster disappeared the third time he appeared. And Balaram was so terrified, he fell and he called Krishna. Passed out unconscious out of sheer terror. And Krishna wakes up, he thinks he's heard his name. And he looks down and he sees, oh, Balaram's fallen asleep. Oh, my poor, poor guy. He's gotten too tired. Oh, he, he can rest now. So Krishna gets up. And he's going to keep watch while his brother rests. And this huge monster appears before Krishna says, how dare you trespass in my forest? And Krishna looks at him and completely unperturbed and says, what do you want? The monster gets a little smaller and disappears. Krishna's keeping watch and the monster appears again huge and says, how dare you trespass in my forest? And Krishna looks at him with a little bit of a smile on his face, unperturbed, no racing pulse, no increased blood pressure, completely at ease and calm. And the monster disappears. And the third time he comes back and says, how dare you trespass in my forest? And Krishna's just looking at him completely, almost bored. Just looking at him with complete patience and detachment. And the monster gets smaller and smaller until he becomes a little itsy bitsy monster. And he just puts the monster in his pocket. And in the morning, Balaram wakes up and he tells, oh, Krishna, this terrible thing happened. Krishna, there's this horrible monster. And Krishna gets the itsy bitsy monster out and he says, this? And Balaram says, what? What, what, what? what is that? And Krishna explains to him that he had faced a fearful situation with patience, with self-control, and an unperturbed mind. He kept his composure and he never allowed his unperturbed mind to be disturbed. It was like the top of a quiet lake. No ripples, no eddies, completely calm. So that patient, quiet mind, unperturbed, turned this monster into something negligible, something you could just toss in your pocket. The monster was tamed under Krishna's control. So I think the point of the story is kind of obvious here. When we give way to fear, when we allow fear to control the mind, the monsters of the mind take control over us. We lose because then we're in danger of basically losing ourselves. This is, as Buddha says in the Dhammapada, the worst enemy cannot harm you as much as your own thoughts. Isn't that the truth? As Krishna tells us in the sixth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Udharet atman atmanam, natmanam vavasavayet, atmaiva hyatmana bandur atmaiva ripur atmanaha. 
Sonny Sheshnada made us memorize that verse again and again. He wrote it out in his handwriting, handed to us little slips of paper, memorize this, memorize this. We have to lift the self by the self. In other words, we have to lift the unenlightened portion of our mind by the enlightened portion. We have to lift the lower, the lower mind by the higher mind. We cannot, we cannot allow the mind to give way to the lower mind because the mind alone, when it's awakened, is, is our only friend. And the mind, when it's uncontrolled, when it's unlightened, is our only enemy. That is our enemy. When fear preys on our mind, we forget ourselves. We forget who we are. Now, of course, if we see a car careening towards us in our direction, we are definitely going to get out of the way. That's a normal human response. If a person doesn't, you wonder what, what's wrong with that guy. But if, we are, if it becomes a point of overtaking our mind, of it becoming a monster that makes us fall unconscious, that we lose ourselves, then we have to do something to overcome this obstacle because it, it becomes a huge stumbling block in our own joy and happiness. And why should we give away our joy and happiness when that's our real nature? Joy, happiness, and freedom is our real nature. We can't give that, we can't give that ace in the hole away. That's who we are. That is our real nature. We don't give that away to anybody or anything, let alone unfounded fears. We have to also face the fact that as human beings, we'll have to face certain things in this life, whether we like it or not. Swami Adbhutananda Lachi Maharaj said, as long as you have a body, and I think that includes every one of us, even if I only see your name, I know you got a body. As long as you have a body, you must experience disease, sorrow, fear, pain, and suffering. Anyone who wants to escape all this, okay, yeah, that's me, will have to hold on to God because his bliss will remove all suffering. Hold on to God. So we all have this body to deal with. We can't, we can't avoid it. It has its ups, it has its downs, and it has its in-betweens. So because of that, when we have, are in any kind of difficulty, if we're in fear, if we're in pain, we need to hold on to the divine. And remember, this too shall pass. None of this is permanent. This too shall pass. So rather than getting preoccupied by our fear, our unfounded or founded fears, rather than becoming preoccupied by any pain we may experience, we have to try to put our minds elsewhere in a more positive direction. Because the more we engage thinking about our fear, the more we worry about our fear, the more we think about our pain, the more we worry about our pain, the more we complain about our fear and our pain, the deeper and deeper and deeper that samskara becomes. Our rut goes deeper and deeper and deeper in our minds. And then it becomes a well out of which it's very hard to dig ourselves. So rather than worrying about it or obsessing about it, the worse our pain is going to be. The more we think about it, the more we're unhappy about it, the more we complain about it, the worse we are going to feel. So the Buddha has this wonderful parable about this. The Buddha once asked one of his students, if a person is struck by an arrow, is it painful? And the student replied, it is. And then the Buddha then asked, if a person is struck by a second arrow, is that more painful? And the student replied again, it is. The Buddha then said, in life, we cannot always control the first arrow. However, the second arrow is our reaction to that first arrow. And with this second arrow comes the possibility of choice. That's where our choice, our will comes in. 
you know, we have in, in Vedanta here in Santa Barbara in LA, we have a lot of people who belong to AA, Alcohol Alcoholics Anonymous. And they have a lot of sayings they actually took from Sri Ramakrishna. They didn't realize it at the time, but they do. And they just put it into contemporary American language. And one of their famous maxims is, pain is inevitable, suffering is optional. And that's so true. Because our reaction, whether it's fear or anger or frustration about what life gives to us, causes us to suffer effects of that second arrow. We, we get the first arrow from whatever life deals, us, deals with us. The second arrow is us going, bah! no, bah! we do it to ourselves. Swami Shivananda had debilitating asthma. He would be up at night with a pillow on his chest, not being able to breathe. And he suffered with this for decades. He also had, at the end of his life, he had a debilitating stroke. So the whole right side, side of his body was completely paralyzed. And yet he was in bliss the whole time. People would say, oh, Maharaj, how are you? And he'd say, I am fine, I am fine. I am, I am suffused in bliss. And they'd say, but Maharaj, look at you. Your body is decaying as we see you. And he'd say, oh, you're asking about the body. Oh, yes, that's going in its own way. The body is, is decaying, certainly. But I am full of bliss. I am filled with joy. And okay, so, oh, so, so we're going to take our usual out now. We're all going to go, oh, well, that's different. He was a direct disciple of Ramakrishna. That doesn't count. They're different from you and me, right? It's like, oh, no, no, no. They're evolved souls. They're really different. So that doesn't count. Talk to me about someone like me. But you know what? These direct disciples are our blueprint. We need to have an ideal to work toward. If we find someone just like us, where do we, how do we go further? How do we go forward? We have to have an ideal to work toward. We need that blueprint. These direct disciples are the people we should keep in mind because they had a body and a mind too, hello. They still had a body and mind to deal with. The direct disciples had to deal with, with tuberculosis. That's a lousy way to die. They had to deal with gangrene. They had to deal with strokes and diabetes and beatings everywhere. They had, what to speak of Swami Tri Gunatitananda? Oh my God. He was in 1915, one of the students at the old temple was mentally ill and he threw a bomb at him. It took off the Swami's legs. He lost his legs. The first thing that the Swami did when he when was asked about what, hap what has happened to him. And he said, oh, the poor soul. Oh, the poor soul. He was sorrowful and compassionate for the person who threw the bomb at him. He was alive for three days after that, suffering with terrible pain and gangrene. And the nurse who tended to him said, I have never seen such a calm, uncomplaining, and enduring patient in all my life. Now, I would never try to, do, I'm sure I would complain if someone threw a bomb and took off my legs. I'm sure I'd have something to say about it but I might still be reminded that there's a higher road to take. There's a better way to go. Because the more I complain, the more I whine, the more I say, why did that happen to me? The more I'm finding that second arrow and stabbing myself with it. These are the blueprints that we need to follow. Bearing pain with patience and as much detachment as we can muster will lessen our pain. It's very simple. If we want to suffer less, hello, none of us want to suffer more. We have to remember to just, okay, step back, take a step back, practice a little detachment, say, okay, this too shall pass. This isn't for eternity. It shall pass. So it's our emotional involvement in it and our fear, our fear of pain, our fear that maybe we will have pain, our fear of maybe what this pain may bring. Maybe it's something more. 
maybe then this will happen and then that will happen. And that was like, we make up these scenarios for ourselves and make ourselves unnecessarily misery, um, miserable. We sell away our innate freedom and joy. No point to it. We, we can't put that second arrow in ourselves and be happy. So that fear that we have is the monster that we really would rather just drop on our pocket. Can we just, if we're able to take a step back, bear with patience and forbearance, then we can take that monster who would like to overtake our life, become small enough that we can just say, okay, I'm just going to stick you here for the time being. Okay, you can just beat, beat yourself around in here. I'm not going to deal with you. I'm just going to let you, I'm just going to let you go like that. So we want it an um, itsy bitsy thing, not a monster who's going to knock us unconscious. You know, we all know we have a body and we know it's going to come with, it comes in a package. The package is that this is going to include pain, death, grief, separation from loved ones, disease, and death. Okay. We are not exempt from the laws of nature. None of us, every single one of us. Shrema Krishna wasn't. Holy Mother wasn't. Swamiji wasn't. Dirk disciples weren't. All of them had to suffer the effects of the body. So guess what? We're in, we've got the package too. How do we deal with it in such a way that we can feel our freedom and joy without being assaulted and having our joy and, and our happiness and our freedom taken away from us? But the funny thing is, oddly enough, sometimes, I don't know whether it's just California, but I somehow don't think so, um, devotees are somehow offended that they should be visited by pain and suffering and all sorts of troubles. I don't get it. Like somehow they should be exempt because God's on their side. It's like, hey, I'm a devotee. Why should I have to suffer that? One devotee cl very close to us was complaining a great deal about how much she was suffering. Her body hurt so much and her husband had to go through so much. And then her son and her daughter-in-law was, I mean, definitely some, some family tragedies and yeah, no kidding. These things happen. And so she said, I don't understand how Takura and Ma can allow that to happen. And I said, look, Takura had cancer. Hello. It was awful. It was awful. He was absorbed in bliss. But to people looking at it, it was like, wow, that's bad. Look what mother had to endure from her own family members. Oh, my God. Look how much Swamiji suffered. He lost his sister to suicide. How ill he was in his life. He was betrayed by some of the people closest to him. And what did he say? I am glad I suffered so. And glad to find release. It's only attitude. They all suffered. But this devotee, I kept bringing this up. She kept complaining, no, no, no. Takura Ma, how could they do that to us? How could they? I said, look, one of our nuns right now has Alzheimer's, very advanced Alzheimer's. Another, these are my contemporaries. They're, they're within a few years of me. Another one has very debilitating illness that she's her, her physically completely disabled. And she said, oh, no, 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 but my family, my family. I said, look. Takor and mother are not a slot machine. You don't do your japa and dhyan and your sadhu seva and then stick it and say, okay, home free, I'm exempt because I did my part, now you do yours. I said, you don't pull down the handle. We all have karma full of baby. All of us have to experience the results of our own thoughts and actions. Just because we're devotees doesn't mean we're exempt from our own thoughts and actions. True, being a devotee means that these effects are mitigated. Mother said that if your arm should be cut or cut off, it will become a scratch. But still, the effects of the karma, of the effects of our karma, the karma full of the effects of our own thoughts and actions will have to bear fruit whether we like it or not. They will come 
because we ordered them special delivery. It's like we ordered the pizza. I didn't order that, you did. Maybe it's your past life you ordered that pizza, but baby, it's coming. Red hot and ready for you. The knock is on the door. Pizza man, that's our karma fulla. So we can, we, can, we can rage, we can complain, we can say that it's not fair, but it's better if we just say, thy will be done, thy will be done. All of us have to experience karma fulla. We were really able to see it in other people. It's like, oh, this person did that. Oh, wow. Boy, that's some karma coming. You, and you can see it really well in other people's lives. It's like in our, our own lives, not so much. Not so much. It's like, bang. I don't know why that happened. Oh, really? You know, probably your next door neighbor would be really happy to tell you about why that happened. So being a devotee mitigates our karma, or the karma fuller, absolutely. But most importantly, being a devotee gives us the strength and the perseverance to, in, to endure what life gives us. That is the advantage of being a devotee, not to have the blackboard erased but to be able to deal with what life gives us with, with, with an unperturbed mind, with strength, and to be able to make that experience a part of our spiritual life. Not denying it, but to say, yes, this has come to me, and to make it something that makes us stronger, wiser, more compassionate, more giving us more detachment from what the world gives us. So what it also reminds us is that the more time that we spend in our sadhana, the more time we spend in our japa, the more the time we spend in our meditation, the more that we spend time in, in doing our, our bhajan and chanting, singing the Lord's name, singing, singing songs to the divine, the more faith we develop, the more strength, the more time we spend in the sadhana, and the more that we experience this, the more faith we develop, the more we experience the presence and the power of the divine in our own lives. That becomes more and more real to us. And that very tangible presence in our lives gives us great strength and comfort and guidance when we need it the most. That is our job. That is our armor for that second era, our own spiritual practice. If we don't put on the armor, more than likely when we see an arrow, we're just gonna get another arrow and stick it in our chest because we're in the habit of looking for blame elsewhere instead of making ourselves stronger. Being a devotee also gives us what we never want to hear about. And that's the R word. The, the least popular word in the Vedanta lexicon, renunciation. Ew. Everybody hates hearing about renunciation. It's the, don't ever talk about it because people will just say, if you try to give a talk on renunciation, I promise you, nobody going to hear it. They don't want to hear it. Don't tell me about that. They'll say, can't I just enjoy the world and the Divine Mother and have Mother take care of me? Oh, sure. Go ahead. Just go ahead and enjoy it. But you may not like her Divine Play. You might not like her Leela. Go ahead and enjoy it. You just might not like when she dances and she's dancing with her cleats on. You might not like this experience. Swami Shivananda said, this is all the Leela of God. In one form, he is bringing pain to so many people, persecutes them with famine, with sickness, and with grief and pain. He gives to so many people. And then in another form again, he inspires people to remove the distress of humanity. So of course, go ahead and enjoy the play of the Divine Mother. You just might not like the play. Because sometimes she plays hardball. 
sometimes the play is not what we want to deal with. This pandemic is definitely the play of Macaulay. Not many people are crazy about it. A lot of people are saying, you know, Whoa, what did I do? What did we do to deserve this? It's like, well, you want to play? Here you go. So go ahead and enjoy the world. But remember that being embodied, we have to endure all this. We will inevitably experience pain, old age, disease, grief, death. All of that comes, all of that comes with it. And this is why the ancient sage, the poet, the great Sanskritist, Bhartri Hari, wrote the Vairagya Shatakam, 100 verses on the R word, renunciation. He said, in enjoyment, there is the fear of disease. In honor, there is the fear of losing it. In strength, there is the fear of the success of enemies. And in beauty, there is the fear of old age. In erudition, there is the fear of defeat from other scholars. In virtue, there is the fear of scandal. In body, there is the fear of death. Everything is fraught with fear. Renunciation alone is fearless. Renunciation alone is fearless. Okay, so renunciation doesn't mean going off to join an ashrama or joining a convent or a monastery. It doesn't mean finding a nice cushy cave in the Himalayas with a heater and AC and all that. It doesn't mean quitting your job and staying home to meditate. It doesn't mean t telling your kids to go someplace else and telling them, no, you can have a spiritual life so you want to meditate. It means lessening our identification with the body-mind complex and remembering that all this is changing at all times because all of this will go over time, all of it including our own body and mind, and including the body and mind of those we love so dearly. We love more than ourselves. And this is actually how Swami Advaitinanda, the elder Gopal, as we meet in the gospel, came to spiritual life. He was 55 years old. His wife had died, and he was beside himself with grief. And so a friend of his took him to meet Sri Ramakrishna. And after two or three visits to, to Sri Ramakrishna, the elder Gopal was so taken by him and by his teachings that he left everything. And he just moved in with Sri Ramakrishna. And he was the only, he was the only male devotee, apart from Lachi Maharaj, who could, who could see Holy Mother face to face. She would speak directly to him and Lachu. That was it. Not even Swami Sardananda could see her face. He said, do you think I'm your father-in-law? He said, I can never see her face. She said, and during Shrama Krishna's last illness, Swami Advaitinanda served him wholeheartedly, steadfastly, that whole time in Kasipur. After Thakur's death, he joined the monastery at Baranagor. And when they all took sannyasa vows, Swami Vivekananda gave him the name Swami Advaitinanda, one whose bliss is in the non-duality of Brahman. So here is a person everybody can identify with. He didn't begin his spiritual life till, till his wife died when he was 55. He wasn't in the bloom of youth. He wasn't like we can't say, oh, well, he began his spiritual life at 12. Or he could see a light in his forehead when he was three. That does, no, I cannot, I can't identify. Anybody can identify with Swami Adwaitanaga. He was past middle age when he began his spiritual life. But then he gave it his all. He gave everything to him. So he said later that Takur had given him the experience that it was Takur alone, he was shown that as Takur alone, that is manifested through all and in everything. And he said, then whom to blame, who to criticize? And so after this experience, he couldn't bring himself to criticize or say a word of condemnation to anybody. 
because Tucker had given him the realization that everything was Sri Ramakrishna, everything. Couldn't find fault with anybody. So here's a person who put everything into his spiritual life, age 55, but he poured his whole heart into it. And Sri Ramakrishna had shown him that it was he who was manifested in all. And this experience is verified in the Chandi, in the Devi Mahatmya, when in the 10th chapter, the Devi said, I am all alone in the world here. Who else is there here except me? Nothing but the Divine Mother everywhere. Every experience is nothing but the Divine Mother, nothing but Ma Durga. And that brings us back to fearlessness, because as we famously read in the Brihad Duranyaka Upanishad, there is fear from the second. There, anytime there is duality, there is fear. The sense of duality inevitably brings fear. That's when we can try to remember Sri Ramakrishna is manifest in everyone and in everything. That's when we can try to remember I am all alone in the world here. Who else is there besides me? It's all the Divine Mother. Or we can remember what Sri Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita. I am the beginning, the middle, and the end of all creations. There is nothing but Krishna playing everywhere in this universe. Fear often comes when we feel like we're kind of losing our footing. We feel like we're kind of losing that stability and permanency that we feel because we all have this sense of stability, the sense of permanency, that some things are permanent and stable and unchanging. And then we get this pandemic. It's like all of a sudden we think, oh my God, I could die. I'm like, hello, that can happen any second. One traffic light missed, one slip in the bathroom, one heart attack, one stroke, like that, like that. But we never think about it until it's like, oh, pandemic, oh my God, uh, where's the hand sanitizer? But things, nothing is ever the same from one minute to the next. Things are constantly changing, always in flux, always in flux, but we refuse to acknowledge it because it's uncomfortable. We don't want to admit that everything is, because we seek that stability. We want things to stay the same so we can deal with it, so we can control it. So it can be just like we want it to be. We see friends after a long, long time, after many years, and we look at them and go, oh my God, they've gotten so old. And we don't realize they're also going, oh my God, look how old she is. She's really, really gotten old. See how she's kind of stooping there? It's like, uh-uh, it goes both ways. But we all have this sense of stability, of permanency. It's a delusion. This is changing at every minute. This is changing at every minute. What doesn't change? The Atman. Atman alone is unchanging. Everything else flux. That's why they call it samsara. Changing, changing, changing. Things are constantly changing, but we don't like it. Sri Ramakrishna said, the mudfish thinks it's very safe because it's there so comfortably at the bottom of the pond. It's there in the mud and so nice and warm and comfy. It doesn't realize there's a net underneath it. Then the fisherman comes and pulls up the net. And it's, oh, you know what? We're going to get pulled up too. 100% chance we're going to get pulled up too. We're, we're at that bottom of that lake. So rather than saying, why? We go, yeah. We need to acknowledge it, prepare for it, make peace with it. Because death is an if, but when. Do you know people who say, if I die, it's like, if? If you die? I have a friend of mine who wrote a book called If I Die. It's like, really? <laughs> Tell me this is an if-when clause. When I die, we have to be prepared to be pulled up too, because it can happen any second. So we have to get used to the idea, acknowledge it, and remember that all these things that we see before us 
all of it shall pass away, all of it. Don't avoid thinking about it, prepare for it, remember it. The good shall pass away, the bad shall pass away. Everything that we loved shall pass away. Everything we owned shall pass away. Everything we fought for shall pass away. Everything we didn't like shall pass away. Everything will pass away except the Atman. When we make peace with that, we realize, oh, what a relief it is to come to terms with it. And then that fear dissipates. It just becomes in the pocket. That's what we need to do. Address it. You know, it was a few weeks I was thinking about the topic that Usha and I kind of decided upon. I was thinking about the idea of fearlessness. And then this line from the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita just kept ringing my ears again again. Neha bikramana shosti pratyavayo navidyate svalpam apyasya Trayate mahato bayat. Yes, mahato bayat. In this, there's no loss of effort, nor is there any harm. Even a little of this dharma protects us from the great fear. Mahato bayat. Okay, what is the great fear? Death. But it isn't just death. Because if we die in an unillumined state, if we die without freedom, without liberation, that means bingo, we go right into rebirth. With rebirth means we get a body all over again. Okay, here comes the package. Death, birth, grief, pain, attachment, suffering, entanglement, again and again in this, we're not free from samsara and it's Groundhog Day, all over again. It's Groundhog Day. That is the great fear, being caught in the net of samsara, being trapped in samsara. Because not only do we get a new body, we got all that karma falla that we got to deal with all over. It's there on that tree perched waiting to jump on us. Got to deal with it. But as Krishna has, says before this verse, He's reminded, because he talks about that this dharma protects us from this great fear. What is he talking about? He's talking about the reality of the divine within us. He's talking about, na jayate mriyate va karachin, na yam bhutva bhavita na buyaha, ajo nityaha shashito yam parano, na hanyate hanyamane sharire. In what tremendous words of strength. Know the Atman, unborn, undying, never ceasing, never beginning, birthless, deathless, unchanging forever. How can it die the death of the body? Bodies are said to die, but that which possesses the body is eternal. I mean, what words of strength. So remembering these ideas protects us from this Mahato Bayat, this great fear that we have. And we also remember now, because it's important to really do it now, no effort, as Krishna says, is wasted in our spiritual life. So we, we need to work on it now so we can enjoy interest in our investment, right? We all like interest in our investment. We hate it if we get no interest in our investment. So we need to, to make, well, Swami Sheshtan used to say, we make hay while the sun is shining. It's like, okay. So in worldly life, if we start a project and we don't finish it, then our work is like we don't get any good results. Okay, we start building a house and then halfway through we go, nah, don't want to do it. Okay, so the rain comes in, the rats move in, all the, all the copper wiring rots. You know what they have to do? If someone buys the lot, they have to tear down the house. We decide... I'm going to make a cake about halfway through. You go, you know what? I'm not going to do this. You don't have an edible cake. You don't even have the batter. You stuck it in the oven. You took it out right away. Just got to throw it in the garbage. Spiritual life is exactly the opposite. All effort is rewarded. Every bit of effort is rewarded. It's all paid forward. No matter how 
Svalpamapi, even a little bit, is paid forward. No effort is wasted. You know, Swami Vivekananda was the king of fearlessness. And Sri Ramakrishna loved him for that. And he fa Swamiji famously said, be not afraid of anything. It is fear that is the greatest cause of misery in this world. It is fear that is the greatest of all superstitions. It is fear that is the cause of all our woes. And it is fearlessness that brings heaven even in a moment. Therefore, he said, arise, awake, and stop not till the goal is reached. So when we begin to feel fear kind of gnawing at us, we strike it back and say, no, uh-uh. Who have I to fear? The Divine Mother is my mother. Is she someone to mess with? Are you crazy? Do you know who my mother is? I'm a child of Takura and mother. Huh. Or you can think, I'm eternal. I am unborn. I am undying. Who or what can possibly bother me? So when we think, we feel fear kind of rubbing at us, kind of nipping at our heels, we start thinking, I'm not okay with this. Then we take a nice big breath. We smile at ourselves. We don't, we don't attack ourselves. We don't berate ourselves. We never say, you shouldn't feel that way. We just smile at ourselves and say, okay, you're feeling that way? Okay. Let's think another way right now. Never a sadhu in India told me very wisely many years ago, never get into a head-on confrontation with your mind. You will always lose. Always go from a different angle. So we think instead, okay, I'm not going to go there. I'm going to think of the Lord, and I'm going to think of my guru, and I'm going to think of my mantra because that is protecting me. The Lord and mother are protecting me. My guru is protecting me. And no matter what, you can cut off my arms, my leg, my head, my neck, but I still have my mantra. And that is all powerful because that is the presence of God itself in that mantra. And that wisdom can take us through anything. We remember, I am nestled in mother's arms. I am taken care of. And she will carry me through everything I need to deal with. We put ourselves against mother's heart and we let her carry us wherever, wherever we have to be. You know, if you're a baby and you're in your mother's arms, a baby never says, oh my God, my mother, she could drop me. No baby ever thinks my mom's going to drop me. Baby is perfectly safe, happy, uncomplaining. No baby ever worries about life. So when we trust in the divine, when we trust in the truth of the eternal, unborn, undying Atman, we have no fear from that second arrow. We're not going to stab ourselves with it. So let that first arrow come, come or not. We'll have many arrows in life to deal with. That's fine. But we don't want to make it our life. And we don't need to give ourselves that second arrow. We don't need to throw away our innate peace, joy, and freedom. And then we can always remember the words of Holy Mother Shisarda Devi. Never fear. When you are in distress, just say to yourself, I have a mother. Om Pur Namada. Poor Nami Dum, poor Nat, poor Nam Utachete, poor Nasya, poor Nama Daya, poor Name Baba Shishate, Om Shanti Shanti Shanti, Hari Om Tatsat, Sri Ramakrishna Panamastu. And if 